It's a pleasure to be here, everyone. Nice to see you. So 15 minutes is not enough time to really talk about keloid. So we're going to talk about some tricks and some of the tips that I have, what I've learned actually by accident <laughs> over the years, because there's not much actual teaching in keloid care, is there? There's not many publications that are worthy of reading either. So we're really kind of on our own, and this is what I've discovered over the last 25 years or so. So I have no conflicts of interest for today's presentation, and that's one of the problems with keloids. I have no conflicts of interest because no, no pharmaceutical company is really working on this. Very few people are putting money into it. Therefore, I have no conflict of interest. So my first tip is to make sure that you're asking the patients what they want. They come in with these kind of keloids, and it's really daunting, right? How, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do for this woman? Ask them what they want, because they may not want what you think they do. Most of the patients come into my office, and they say, you know what? I just want to cut these things off. And what they really mean is that they want it gone by whatever means, and they want it gone yesterday, right? Few of them understand, however, what this process entails, how, just how difficult this is. Anyone can cut off a keloid. The trick is making it not come back. Most patients, unfortunately, are not actually surgical candidates. So the fact that they want it cut off is at odds with what we can actually do for them. And most of them need to be convinced to pursue other options. And of course, what they don't want is they don't want injections. They've been injected maybe once, it didn't do a whole heck of a lot, it hurt, and they don't want to do it again. Well, frankly, there's no way for me to make your keloids better without using injections. If they're not up front, they're going to be as adjunctive therapy for weeks and months and years afterwards. So people who are adamant about not wanting injections, I am now finished. That's it. I'm not cutting people who are not going to let me inject them afterwards. And there are people who say absolutely positively, no needles bad surgical candidate, and we're done. So what does the patient actually want? Do they want palliation of their symptoms? Do they want flattening, lightening, softening? I can do both of those things very well. Are they delusional and think we're going to eradicate this and give them a scar, or truly delusional and think we're going to eradicate it and end up giving them normal skin afterwards? So their expectations and their desires are paramount in that consultation with them. This gentleman just wanted to be able to hang an earring on his ear. He didn't much care what it looked like. He just wanted to be able to re-pierce. Why, right? Piercing is what led to this, but that's what he wanted to do. This gentleman just wanted to be able to look up at the sky, and I'm not being poetic here. He was an amateur astronomer, and he just wanted to be able to look up without having to lie down on the grass to see the scar, sky. This gentleman wanted to be able to turn his head from left to right. He said he couldn't drive because he wouldn't, couldn't look at his blind spot. And all we did was cut out that thing that was tethering his chin to his chest and left the rest of it. He didn't care about it. Now he could move his head from side to side. That's what he wanted. This guy didn't like his cleavage, didn't care about the rest of it, just didn't like that big pocket underneath that keloid in the center of his chest. So we cut out the pocket. His breast fell further to the side when he wore his low-cut shirt. I don't get it, but when he wore his low-cut shirt, that pocket wasn't there anymore, and he was a happy guy. And this is my favorite story of all. This gentleman came in. It was on his deltoid area. And I said, so what bothers you about this? What, what do you hope to accomplish with removing this? And he said, my keloid looks like my junk. <laughs> and... I had to admit it kind of did, right? Uh, so if you pardon the expression, we cut off the testicles, we shaved them off, and we injected the corona, and it still looks messy. I just saw him the other day, actually. It still looks messy, but it no longer looks like his junk, and he's a happy guy. So ask them what they want. Often, cutting is not the answer. For this gentleman, this is the guy actually with the tethered neck. This is what his chest looked like. He's not a surgical candidate here. If you cut these off, they're going to recur immediately. So when you're making the decision of whether or not to cut, think about size, shape, location, age of the keloid, not the patient, and patient commitment being the most important. 
Size really kind of doesn't matter. Larger keloids are no more difficult than cut, to cut off than small ones, although it may take a little bit more time. It's not technically difficult. You're basically quite literally just hacking away at the sucker until it all comes off, right? Patients are more impressed with outcome when their keloid was huge to begin with, and residua is more acceptable. They're just happy that the bulk of it is gone. These are the most grateful patients I ever have. They're not looking for perfection. They just want that big wonking thing not to be on their skin anymore. So when you take a tiny little keloid like this and get rid of it, well, yeah, that earlobe looks a little bit better. But whoa, right? This patient is remarkably happy because they took this huge thing and turned it into not so much of a huge thing. So they're very satisfied. The bigger the keloid, the more satisfied they are in my experience. Shape. The pedunculated lesions are the ones you want to look for, especially if you're just starting out with keloids. They're often keloids hanging onto the skin by a stalk that does not contain keloid. It's sort of like a keloid skin tag, right? And all you have to do is lop off the, 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 uh, the stalk and you're done. So this was a keloid that looked a little daunting. It was on a gentleman's back that looks about 15 centimeters, I think. But it wasn't. It was only two centimeters. It was pedunculated. It took maybe two minutes total after the patient was numbed up to get the thing off. Most important part of the cut, to, cut or no cut, though, is patient commitment. If that patient walks away from you after the keloid is removed, which they often do, out of sight, out of mind, coming back. 75 to 100 percent of keloids without adjunctive therapy are going to recur. So you have to make sure that you have their way in in the beginning. I say we're going to be the best of friends for the next couple of weeks, couple of months, maybe a year before you can stop coming to see me to make sure that this isn't going to come back. And you can tell if they're buying into it or not. And I suggest you not approach keloid removal in people who don't buy into that. One of the reasons I think why we, don't, why we cut so frequently is that there's very few no-cut options. And those patients generally already come in saying, I don't want injections. I already had them, right? And intralesional steroids are still the best no-cut options that we have. A couple of tips on steroids. 50 milligrams per cc, period. Always indicated. Some people say, well, it's a keloid on the face and I don't want to give 40. No, 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 no. A keloid is a keloid is a keloid. Regardless of where it is, haul out the 40. Don't spread it too thin. If you've decided that it's only safe to give one cc or two cc's per sitting, well, put it all into one place. Don't put a little over here and a little over there. I think that's what happens frequently when patients come to me and say that, their, that injections didn't work for them in the past. It was spread way too thin. Every time the patient comes in, I say to them, where are we going today? What is the thickest area? What is the most symptomatic area? What's bothering you the most? That's where I'm going to take my entire syringe and put the whole darn thing into that. Obviously, as it gets better, I may be able to do two or three, but spreading it too thin is never a good idea. You want to always want to be injecting horizontally. This is a great picture for showing you the location of that needle placement. It's a lousy picture because that needle is way too small. There's no way steroids are going to get into the keloid with a needle that tiny. But that's the direction. Don't come at it from the top, come at it from the side. And you know how sometimes you, nothing's going in, nothing's going in? So you push harder, and then maybe you redirect and push harder? Don't do both at the same time. I'm sure you've all experienced redirection and pushing harder, and boom, the whole thing goes in to the subcutis, right? And then the whole keloid sinks as a keloid down into the skin. Doesn't do you any good. And also make sure you use a big wonking needle, 21, if, you, if the patient will let you do it. Small, the larger the better. I have a trick for injecting very super hard keloids. So this is, was a very hard keloid, could barely get a 23 gauge needle into it. Um, so what I really wanted to do was make parallel tracks along this keloid like this, injecting her steroids. Well, she's never going to let me do that with a 21 gauge needle, so I do a ring box of lidocaine. And then I look for three things, Gorilla Glue, tape, and a big wonkin' needle. So the Gorilla Glue, I don't work for either Gorilla Glue or 3M, by the way. Um, you take a little bit of Gorilla Glue and you put it right down at the base where you're going to stick the needle. And then you take the tape 
and you cut up tiny little pieces and you stick it on your non-dominant hand like when you're wrapping packages, right? Um, and then you inject. You inject right into the, into the first track and if you pull out that needle, the steroid is going to come flowing out, right? So as you're going to pull out the needle, you stick the piece of tape over the hole. The Gorilla Glue holds it in place and the steroid doesn't come out. So all you're doing on that first visit is depositing steroids into the track of the needle. The next time, you'll be able to start injecting the normal way. It works very well. Don't sweat hypopigmentation. It always happens. In fact, I think it may be necessary for hypopigmentation to occur for the keloid to really go away. That little squiggly line in that bottom picture is where I injected too deep and it ended up in the lymphatics. That goes away too. Looks funny, but it goes away. So it may take six to 12 months, but it always goes away, right? So it always gets better. I tell my patients every time they come in and we see these little hypopigmented spots, I say, I did that to you. The medicine is what did that. Do you want me to stop? Because if I keep going, it's gonna get lighter still. Never once in, oh my gosh, I counted it up the other day, 38 years, oof, has anybody said, no, don't give me more steroids. They don't care about the hypopigmentation and it's gonna go away. Embrace interferon and radiation therapy if you haven't already as adjunctive therapy when you decide to cut. Interferon 1.5 million units per linear centimeter into the base and the walls at the time of surgery and then one week later. Maximum of 10 million units or the patient gets a lot of flu-like syndromes. Make sure you pre-treat with acetaminophen and tell the patient that they shouldn't have any obligations that night and perhaps could, should be able to take the day off the next day if they have to. The nice thing about interferon is that it's only two times. Day of surgery, they're already there. One week later, they're probably gonna show up for that follow-up visit. So even if they bail on you after that, they've finished their adjunctive therapy in those first two weeks. Same thing with radiation therapy. It's ineffective, unfortunately, on existing keloids, but it works very well post-surgically. It's the most effective post-surgical adjunct that we have. You do it the day of surgery, and then whenever the radiation therapist says it should be done. Some people say a week later, four days later, 10 days later, they don't tell me how to cut, I don't tell them how to radiate, right? whatever it is that they, that they do. Again, the patient is done now with two augmented therapies in the first two weeks of therapy. So again, if they disappear, Hopefully, things will go well, even though they disappeared. Treat acne aggressively. How often have you seen just keloids, but only in an acne distribution? This had to have come from acne. Sometimes I don't even see any pimples. All I see is, is keloids, but they have to be there. Apparently, these, the, the, the acne lesions are forming and immediately turning into keloids, blossoming into keloids. So I actually treat these people with isotretinoin if they're developing new ones. You know, not to obviously to treat the keloids, but to stop the freight train, right? To get it so that they're not making new ones while we're treating the old ones. Don't pick a single adjunctive therapy. If you come away from here saying, well, steroids work and interferon works and radiation therapy works, pick them all. Pick everything that's appropriate for that particular patient. Interferon on day one and seven, radiation on day one and whatever, pressure if it's appropriate with like pressure earrings like these, intralesional corticosteroids. I like to do it at the time of surgery into the base and the walls of the excision, one week later, two weeks later, then every two weeks, regardless of what the keloid look, the spot looks like. I don't care if it's flat and soft and no apparent keloid remaining, I'm still injecting that sucker for several months. And then finally I switch over to monthly. And I stop usually at about six months and see how things go. And if it starts to pop back up again, immediately go into another six months of monthly injections. So frequently removing a keloid and guaranteeing that it won't come back if it's on the trunk is gonna take a year. Lastly, never promise perfection. These people are never going to look normal. They're going to look better. On the left is my best outcome ever. In the middle is a pretty darn good outcome. You should have seen the size of the keloid to begin with. And you've already seen the picture over on the right. That started off as a big, thick plaque. 
This is considerably better, but it's still, frankly, pretty ugly, right? So do not promise perfection. There's always going to be residua. But now she can put on a shirt, and you don't see a lump on her arm, which is a step in the right direction. So I leave you with a thought, because you're the young folks, and you're the ones who are going to go forward and figure this problem out for me. How do we stop the freight train? You groaned before when you saw this gentleman, right? And you thought, I'm glad he didn't walk into my office because I wouldn't know what to do. Well, I didn't either. Uh, we took care of the other pedunculated lesion that was hanging on his cheek. He disappeared. He came back a couple of years later, two years later. You ready? Look at how much more worse he was. I wish I had something to stop that from happening while I was working on eradicating the, the keloids that he already had. We need something to do that. I'm sure there's going to be a biologic that will be able to do this. Dupilumab seems to hold some promise, uh, but it's up to you guys to figure out which, that, which treatment that is that's going to stop this from happening. Forget looking up at the stars, right? So please take care of this for me because I'm too old to do it myself. Thank you very much for your attention.